Yo, welcome to Mental Score Magic YouTube. Today, I'm gonna go over my updated for Brilliant Stars Mew list, and we're gonna do a VOD review of a game I played because A, I think the VOD reviews are nice as a chance for me to look back at my play, but also to really explain the plays instead of focusing on doing them. And also, it's hard to get good games with Mew. And this is actually a very good game that showed the options that the deck has. And so I thought, oh, this seems better than going on ladder and getting a bunch of concessions on turn two because I got the Meloetta or, you know, that kind of stuff. Here's the updated list. It's nothing super interesting as far as like, what are other people playing? We have four switching cards. We have four balls of each. We have four battle pads. It's, it's four of four of almost everything in the deck. We play the two, two stadium split, uh, the two choice belts, the one double turbo energy. I really like choice belt. It's playable. It's almost always a power tablet in the mirror match. It makes it a little not, it makes it not as bad when you end up with that awkward, like, oh, I have to KO a Meloetta on the first turn, or, you know, it just ends up that awkward, like, oh, I have to boss every turn, but you know, now I'm a prize behind, or you miss a boss, and you have to go into a Mew Max. It makes it easier to Oko a Mew Max. So I'm a big fan of the choice belt in the deck. And then one thing that's different from the game and now is I have an Oracorio. We've seen a bit of an uptick in Arceus and Rapid Strike Mali. And the Rapid Strike Mali matchup gets much better with the Oracorio for sure. Otherwise, I think it's really bad. And Arceus, you force them to have a choice belt as well on that first turn. So if you go second and you whiff the attack, you know, they can't just go with like, oh, I'm going to use the ability and go get boss and get a KO. Makes it a little more awkward there. So it does fix some pretty relevant math. But anyway, this is the list I'm currently at. Uh, the one of Echoing Horn is another option that I don't see a lot of people playing. Arceus Duraludon just did very well at the full grip tournament. That matchup becomes much better, if not favored. Oh, I'm really hesitant to say that, but it's Mew, so it's kind of it's kind of pretty good. I'd say pretty potentially just favored if you play the horn, because if you go second, you can get the turn one Meloetta KO. Another big thing about these is it makes it easier to KO a Duraludon V or an Arceus on that first turn. So we play for the Meloetta on turn one. If you go turn two, you can get the boss KO on anything that they've got. And then instead of having to go through two Duraludons, you can go through one Arceus. Horn another Arceus, and if you get that turn one KO, you can actually just go like KO a Duraludon or KO an Arceus. They go with the second Arceus, you can KO it, and then just horn the last one. So I'm a big fan of the horn for that matchup specifically, but there's other matchups that's cool for, like Suicune, for example. They try and go in with that single prizer on that turn. They have to fill their bench on the same turn. Rose is going to horn it back. Uh, Sableye, you just horn back the Sableye that they probably researched or quick balled away or whatever, and you're good there. So I like the horn. I think it is a good card. Anyway, let's go ahead and we're going to do a VOD review of the game. So we're going to rewatch the game and talk about all of the options. All right, so we are re-watching the game. I played this on my Twitch stream, but I want to talk about some of the options because I thought it was a super interactive game. So we don't know what we're up against. We are up against a fellow content creator, though, so shout out to Goldfish Pro. And let's go ahead and see what that starting hand is. Starting hand is beautiful because you just don't want to start the Genesect. That's pretty much it. But we're going first. Ideally, going first, you want to start Mew, obviously, but putting the Meloetta in the active is also totally fine because if it's a mirror match or something like that, we kind of want the Meloetta to be there so that we can still win on the prize trade. So starting the Meloetta is totally good. And with this opening hand, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and battle VIP pass. Let's see what we top deck. Okay, so we see a Sobble. We don't know what my opponent's playing. Uh, could be Suicune, Leafeon, Urshifu, a ton of different Inteleon decks. Uh, Malamar is another one. So it's another reason having the Meloetta in the active is kind of nice. But anyway, with this opening hand, we do have a lot of options. So one thing we do is we battle VIP pass. And Quick Ball. Battle VIP pass and Quick Ball, we can get two Genesects and a Mew. The Mew means we can throw the Choice Belt on it and the Psychic Energy on it as well, and then just draw a whole bunch of cards. The other question is, do we want to bench this Meloetta or not? In a blind situation, I am a fan of benching this Meloetta. If I knew what my opponent was playing, the answer would probably be, well, not probably, would potentially be different, but without knowing what they're playing, I'm going to say yes. I think putting the Meloetta down is totally fine. We're going to get rid of the boss. We're going to get rid of the boss because we play four boss. We want to pair this hand down and draw as much as we can. The odds of us having to boss four times in a game to win are incredibly low. So we're kind of fine getting rid of it. 
I should have paused there. We're going to quick ball away the ultra ball instead of ultra balling away the quick ball and the ultra ball. I want to keep the ultra ball in hand so I can get the turn to Mew or thin my hand if I draw very poorly here. Our last bench spot is going to be for the Mew. You always want to have two Mews on the bench. I see a lot of ladder players make this mistake where they end up like three Genesex, two single prizers. Be like, oh, my single prize is going to get KO'd. Not always. And if it doesn't get KO'd, you want a Mew on the bench. Otherwise, you can't use Psychic Leap. And if I'm playing another deck and I know you can't Psychic Leap because you mismanage your bench, I'm in a much happier spot than I would be otherwise. So in this case, we're going to go Mew Mew, Genesect, Genesect, and two single prizers. Uh, with the two Meloettas because they were in our hand, but I talked about earlier, I've since added an Oricorio to the list. Normally, the Oricorio would be fine to be down here as well. So we're set up for next turn. No reason to play any of these cards. If they Marnie us, we want the Ultra Ball in deck. We want everything else in deck. And we see a Fighting Energy and a Keep Calling. So now we kind of assume it's Urshifu. At least that would be my assumption because Fighting Energy and Sobbles, but they haven't scooped yet, so well, maybe not. Anyway. Good turn for them or bad turn for them. We'll see. Now, what are we going to do to win this game? One thing that's also important, I forgot I mentioned because this is a one and a half times speed. When I did the prize check on the first turn, we prized two fusion strike energies. I know. Oh my gosh, we lose. I'm so unlucky. No, we just have to play around it. So because we prized two fusion strike energies, we can Elisa for one. It's not super good. So I don't know if we really want to Elisa this turn. I think the optimal thing is actually go in with this Mew and save the Meloetta. If they're playing Urshifu, they can't KO a Mew VMAX. Obviously, if they're playing something else, they still probably can't get the turn two KO on the Mew. Uh, yeah, so we're going to go ahead and switch into the Mew. I think we should put the Fusion Strike Energy on the Mew as well instead of the, uh, what's it called? Going Fog Crystal for a basic energy. It does kind of remove one Elisa out if they Marnie us, but I think it's totally fine. So Ultra Ball, grab the Mew VMAX. We don't need either of those. Go and switch into the Mew VMAX. Attach the Fusion Strike Energy to it. Go and switch into the Mew. And then the other debate is do we burn the Crystal or not? The Crystal gets a guaranteed energy next turn. Go and slow down. Mew plays fast. Uh, I think holding the crystal is correct. The guaranteed energy for next turn feels very good. Because Elisa only gets us one, we really only have two energies in the deck, so keeping the one of crystal in hand was good. Now we drew into a second crystal, so we can quick ball the battle VIP pass, fail. Play one fog crystal, fail, and then draw more cards. I don't want to evolve this Mew on the bench either because I want to keep the psych psychic leap play open. So I'm going to go there, fail, play one of these, fail, and draw three more cards. We're holding on to the tablet because I still don't know exactly what they're playing. If this turns out to be like, I don't know, Suicune with a one of fighting energy in it for a Zapdos or some jank, like, I don't know. The tablet could be incredibly important and we don't have to draw anything. At this point, we're just drawing cards to draw cards. There's no other reason. We're not digging for anything. We're going to hold on to the VMAX. Uh, we can just play the crystal next turn to draw more cards. And we're going to go ahead and max Miracle here for the easy KO. No reason to boss. Let's get rid of the one with the energy on it. Make them have a switching card in order to attack. So now let's see uh, if my opponent can pull off anything on this turn. And there's a quick ball of a quick shooting. Of course, you know, they play Sobble. They play quick shooting. And finally, turn two, we learn it is Hoopa Moltres with the one of energy for the Galarian Zapdos. So they're going to have to drizzle for a net. Again, KOing the thing with the energy is good. In this situation, now that we know what the deck is, attacking with the Mew is actually the optimal play. If we attack with the Meloetta, they KO it. Attacking with the Mew means they're poking me, sure, but they're not KOing me, and that's really nice. Uh, yeah, so they're going to hit me for 90. That's not enough. And then next turn, we can potentially go in with the other Mew VMAX if we draw into like a double turbo energy. Or something like that. So our current plan is... It's a very good Marnie for us. Hand wasn't super good. Uh, the current plan is we're going to go... They're going to hit me. I want to attack with this Mew VMAX on the next turn. We drew very well to get there. So we're going to go with this Mew VMAX. Then they're going to go... I'm going to go down to four prizes, sorry. And then we want to be able to Elisa or something to a Meloetta. Now, of course, this is kind of awkward. Because we have both of our Fusion Strike energies accounted for. But maybe they have to Marnie us again. Who knows? So that's our current 
plan. We want to go Mew VMAX, fresh Mew VMAX, because they could KO me with a uh, Moltres plus the uh, Choice Belt. On the following turn, when I have four prizes left, if I keep this thing in the active, so we want to go switch between, and then we want to go to the Meloetta. We just want to put as much pressure on them as possible. They hit me for 90. All right. Uh, Rose Tower. A burnable card for sure. We can go into Ultra Ball away the Battle VIP Pass and that Rose Tower. We do not need them. Go grab a Mew VMAX. Put the double turbo energy on the Mew VMAX. And that's going to let us uh, attack with it. We're also kind of looking for a boss. The Ultra Ball gets us a shuffle of the deck, which is quite nice because two boss were on the bottom. There's a boss. Also an Elisa, which would have been great, but uh, we can't actually use I mean, we can use it. It just seems bad. So now the Hoopa's bait. The Hoopa's almost always bait in this matchup. All of these are better to KO than the Hoopa. So the next question becomes, what do we KO? If we look at their discard pile, they've only used one net. KOing the Coco is cool, but it doesn't feel as good as KOing this cute little Sobble over here. This tiny little Sobble can become a Drizzile, so that makes Level Ball an out. That makes Scoop Up Net an out. So by KOing the Sobble, we get rid of both of those outs. What we should be doing is we can go and boss the Sobble. A secondary play we could make is Escape Rope and just KO whatever they want and save a boss, but we don't really need to boss more than two more times in this game to win, most likely. We can keep this stupid little hoop alive. We don't care about it. We're going to go chase the Sobble, retreat, and hit him with the Max Miracle. One of the reasons not to target the Coco as well is we cannot Max Miracle with this Mew and get a KO without a damage modifier. So not only do we remove Scoopo Net is out, Level Ball is out. We also, it just becomes awkward to KO the Coco. Unfortunately, no Fusion Strike energy there. So we're kind of hoping to get Marnied, but we're not in the worst spot in the world. They throw down a balloon. Cool. That actually gives us a plus one to not KOing the Coco. So now we don't care about the pivots. Now, if we're going to go boss KO anything, we're KOing like Sobbles and Drizziles and stuff like that. They Marni us. Thank Jesus. And there's an Elisa. That is huge. So the Marnie's massive because now we're going to be able to Elisa and attack with a Meloetta on this turn. And KOing with a Meloetta puts things really awkward for them. They can KO it, and that's fine. But by attacking with Meloetta, what we're going to do is we're going to say you have one prize. And then we can actually get a Psychic Leap KO because now we open a bench spot for a MUV into a second Meloetta. Force them to find boss on that same turn we psychic leaped. And then we can set up another Mew V Max and make them take eight prizes instead of taking, you know, two V Max knockouts. So you can go into Lisa Sparkle. We're going to put the one energy down. Obviously, two would have been very good there. We can go in Ultra Ball as well. So the question is is it worth putting out the training court or not? In this matchup, you almost never want to put out the training court. They're not targeting our energies down aggressively. We should have enough energies to win the game. We have one basic left in deck. And most importantly, we have two fusion strike energies in the, uh, in the deck still. And we still have a training cord. And they have their own training cord. We're not hurting for energies. You can discard that thing. But this is our last Genesect. Do we care? Probably not. There's a world where my opponent's able to boss KO a Genesect with Moltres. It's not a very likely world, and by the time that happens, we probably don't need to draw a ton of cards. So what you do here is we can go oh, an Ultra Ball, the Genesect and the Training Court. We don't want to put those down. We want to save the boss for later. Go ahead and draw some cards. We're looking for, there it is, the Fog Crystal for the basic energy. We still have the Court in deck, so we're good. Go ahead and draw one more just because we can. Retreat and Meloetta, Melodious Echo for 140 damage. We've taken three prizes before my opponent has taken one. That's huge. Also got a fusion strike energy. So they take this knockout. We can bench a Mew and put a fusion strike energy on it. And we're good to go. There's the shady dealings. Let's see if they choose to Marnie us or not. If they don't Marnie us, our hand is absolutely stacked. If they do Marnie us, well, Lisa becomes an out to energy accelerate. That's cool. And there's their own training court, which gives us our energy back too, which is kind of nice. And they draw a booty load. Cool. Easy KO here. No big deal. What we're going to do now is we're going to want a Psychic Leap into the Meloetta. 
So we want to do this with the one with the fusion strike energy because we can then accelerate out of the deck. We top deck the horn. Cool. Nothing in the discard pile. So we're going to bench the Mew. We're going to put the fusion strike energy on the Mew. And now we have to decide who are we going to boss KO? Well, they already have a pivot. So there's no real reason to KO the Coco. This thing already retreats for free. This thing can't do anything, but a scoop up net would make this thing a Shady Dealings Inteleon. So what we want to do here is we want to boss this Drizzile. Again, the Hoopa's bait. We do not want to KO the Hoopa if we can avoid it. It's doing 90 damage, not for weakness. Who freaking cares? We're going to go KO their consistency. We're going to KO the Drizzile. They've got a big hand, but just taking less stuff, giving them less options is so big. This will be the third Sobble that we have KO'd now. And that is how you can beat this deck. I know I'm hype on it. I put out the video. My number one deck for Salt Lake City is Hoopa Moltres. 100% still is. I love that deck. With that said, this is how you beat it as me. I wouldn't be a good content creator if I didn't tell you the truth. So what we should be doing here is we should boss the Drizzile. And we are KOing. Yep, the one of Power Tablet. Not the one of, sorry. But the one Power Tablet gets us that KO. 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh, Burn the other one? I guess we don't need them anymore, actually. That seems fine. We probably need like one more power tablet to finish out this game. And we go Psychic Leap into Meloetta. Draw another card because we can. Ooh, the old cemetery is huge. So with the old cemetery draw, it makes it harder for them to pull off something like a Moltres play. Because now they need three energies in hand and a boss's orders without a single shady dealings. So the cemetery was a huge draw there. I've cut the cemetery from the list you just saw, though. That cemetery is now an Oricorio. So it makes a big difference there. With that said, if I had the Oricorio down, the game would have also been even more favored for us. So eh, that's sure. But we pick the energy up first, get a guaranteed attachment for next turn because we could whiff the energy off of the Fusion Strike systems and the prize cards. And we're going to go ahead and Psychic Leap for plenty of damage, shuffle ourselves into the deck, and go in with the Meloetta. And at this point, we're just kind of hoping that there is no boss from my opponent. So now, uh, yeah, they, I mean, that's it. It's just like, they're going for the Moltres play and they actually discard the Zapdos. Beauty of closed deck list. That means, that means we just have game. Uh, yeah. They have to get the boss KO on the Mew VMAX, and then we can just go attach, horn, boss, switch, bench, draw a bunch of cards looking for our last Mew VMAX. And there is the Moltres getting pinged from that old cemetery there. And do they naturally have the boss in hand and one more energy? If they do, that's fine. We do have an answer. It's just not currently in our hand, but... It exists. It's in our deck. We can draw it. And nope, that is a Hoopa Assault Gate. The Broken Heart, they know it ain't great. That Zapdos is Psychic Weak. We go Echoing Horn, put the Zapdos on the bench, boss it up, and uh, there you go. <laughs> That's beating the counter deck that had, honestly, some pretty good turns. This is a situation where normally we're in a bad spot, prizing the multiple Fusion Strike energies, not being able to Elisa for several turns. But just playing to our outs every single turn and everything worked out. And unfortunately, I hate to tell you, Mew VMAX is a very, very good deck. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, all the other YouTube stuff. Hopefully you learned some stuff uh, and I'll catch you all in the next video. Peace out.